Tim, great to be talking to you. Good to see you again, Joe. Hope you're holding up okay there. You know what? We are doing okay. Thank you. And, and I hope you're doing okay. And, and please extend that to the entire data team. Well, I appreciate the wishes. Everybody's uh, everybody's doing well. No, uh, um, no real confirmed serious cases that we've been aware of since the beginning of the crisis. I think we had two or three people that most likely had it and maybe a confirmed or two, but just rested in their houses. And uh, that's, that's your first and foremost concern. So all good on that front. Absolutely. The important stuff. So, but listen, I know this is a busy time. I know everyone's remote. Um, I really appreciate you, you know, coming forward and, and sharing some time with me to talk a little bit about the industry, Datto, your partners, et cetera. Uh, you know, I got a series of questions. I organized them into maybe categories or chapters, so to speak. Um, I really want to start before the pandemic, or at least before the pandemic began to have an economic impact here in the U.S. Can, can we rewind a little bit to, to January and February of 2020, early this year, before all before things got a little strange, <laughs> how was the MSP industry performing and, and what were your views in terms of how the, the year was looking ahead of all this happening? Yeah. Oh, I mean, th things were as, as good as ever, honestly. I mean, they, uh, you know, you look at anything, you know, signups for DattoCon, you look at uh, sales, you know, for Datto, we, we, all, we always say that where goes the MSP industry goes Datto because we're, we're a partner and, uh, you know, we really you know, like to think of ourselves as technology leaders, but we, we may be laggards in terms of growth. If the industry doesn't grow, data doesn't grow, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're in lockstep with the MSP community. It is our business model. And uh, clearly all the trends were very, very positive. Um, yeah, it seems like five minutes ago, you know, our sales kickoff was in New York City. Um, you know, everybody was pumped up. But, you know, all the January was good. Um, somebody told me the other day, which I had forgotten, that I had a fever and, and was sick, um, you know, for kind of 24 hours at kickoff. And they said, do you think coronavirus is already buzzing around New York? I said, well, I don't know. But, you know, if, if there's some immunity involved, maybe maybe I got lucky. But, yeah. um, you know, it was just business as usual, I think, and looking forward to a, a, a really uh, a really good year. And, and certainly didn't have to see anything in, in our data, our numbers, our partner conversations, road shows. You know, we're so in touch with the partner base that I think you'd have to say it was, uh, you know, it was a bright year ahead. All right. So let, let's fast forward to roughly mid-March. You know, you, yeah. you have the United States de declaring a federal emergency. You know, the, the aha yeah. moment for me, I, I was certainly watching a few IT conferences and also the supply chain uh, get impacted worldwide. But here in the U.S., the aha moment for me was the NBA shutting down and then everything else sort of almost changing overnight, right? Yeah. As all that came down, how closely were you working with the board um, and sort of strategizing? What, what was the chatter at the boardroom level in terms of, of what Datto thought was going on and, and what might you need to do? Yeah, so we, we were lucky to be in, a, in an interesting position in a couple dimensions. One is we still build hardware. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's part of our, our DNA. Austin used to like to say we get our hands dirty. You know, so while we're primarily a software SaaS, you know, kind of subscription business, like most modern tech companies, uh, we do create high performance hardware and networking and, and continuity. And um, so we have supply chain. And, you know, we were watching that from January. And there were clearly some disruptions or potential disruptions. So got a whole team looking at this crisis pretty carefully, saw it come over to Seattle. Um, it really hit home when we had to send our Beijing office home. We've got engineers in Beijing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were home for some number of weeks. I want to say about six and they've come back and we're actually getting a, a nice little lens into what reopening looks like. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a month probably since they've been back in the office, but not every restaurant's open again. You know, yeah. the movie theaters were open for a bit afterwards and then they were closed. And so th there's going to be this kind of series of things. For us at HQ, I can remember went to New York City um, last week of February. Um, and I remember walking into a CVS, Wayne Reedy, one, one of these and uh, buying some toothpaste that I'd forgotten. And I saw this empty shelf and I said to the guy, what was there? And he said, hand sanitizer, they're hoarding it, yeah. right? So, so the news cycle is building and a guy in a pickup truck's coming by and you know, taking all of his hand sanitizer. And you know, not more than a week later or so, we were in Norwalk at headquarters and starting to get the, you know, hey, this guy's got a fever. And we, we actually had our president's club, so our, our top sales awards winners, they were down in Mexico. You know, some guy down there has got a fever. You're thinking, uh-oh, better bring them all home. 
Um, turned out, fortunately, he had something else, and we were able to diagnose that, and, and he's, he's fine. But so I, I think it was that first two weeks of March. At some point, probably on the earlier side, we basically all looked at each other, and I just said, "Let's go home." We knew we could function at home. We've been running trials of functioning at home, and you know it's not going to be perfect. So the sooner you are home, um, the just the better you can operate. Um, mm-hmm. If it's going to have problems, you want to know sooner. If it turns out to be a false alarm, okay, you got a little egg on your face. You know, you kind of slink back into the office in a few weeks. But my pattern matching is from previous global crises, and I think I've been through all of them in the last 30 years. And, uh, you know, you act a little bit right out of the gate without the facts, and, and you try to take, you know, sort of bold action and, and really conservative, obviously, help employees, help partners keep people safe. So it was, it was somewhere, I remember the exact day, but it was somewhere in early March, um, you know, for MSPs that might have taken a week or two longer, I've, I've kind of said, listen, forgive yourself. You're small businesses. Um, that took a week or two longer than Apple and Google. If you're running Apple, it's pretty easy. It's not actually not bold to say, you know, we're going to close our stores for a couple of months. I mean, what do they have? $200 billion of cash or something. So, yeah. you know, they, we're buying the iPhone o- o- over the internet. So what's the difference? And I think the bigs all come out and they're, they're also making political statements. They're, um, but, you know, for the rest of us, we're a kind of a medium-sized business. If you're running a small business, I totally understand why you want to keep the doors open to the absolute 11th hour. That is your livelihood. So there was this transition in March, and I, I don't think anybody should second-guess anybody else about kind of when they, they got the aha, as you said. And, yeah, I miss NBA basketball. My son and I like to watch some of those games, and, you know, we're, we're, we're now all stuck watching The Last Dance, which is highly relevant for me because I was living in – in uh, Illinois during the, the, the Jordan glory years. But for other people, it's like, who's this guy? Maybe. I don't know. That's all you yeah. got on ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to eat what they give you, right? So That's it. Uh, here's a quick question for you about uh, sort of company size and, and, and regionally. So on the one hand, you're not Apple, but on the other hand, you are not a small business. Uh, right. You have scale at this point. You have operations mm-hmm. here in North America, EMEA, Australia, Asia. Mm-hmm. Was it a blanket move where everyone started working from home or did you decide yeah. on a region by region basis? What's been your approach? Yeah, for us, it was a, it was a blanket move other than Beijing, right? They, they yeah. sort of got forced home essentially by, by the government and the, and the sort of speed of the situation there. But the rest of it uh, was a blanket move. We certainly were starting down the regional. I think we had a suspected case in the UK, fine, sent them home for a day or two, deep cleaned it. But I would say within some number of days, two, three, four days, um, you know, you had a couple of functions like engineering saying, well, we could do software development from home. That's all the same. And fine. They might have gone home one day early, but um, we were just spending too much time in the data, you know, which was bad data, as we know by history now, you know, trying to guess cases spread. What's the R naught factor? We're not epidemiologists. Even, even the best people there don't quite know yet. So at some point, I, I had to just sort of make a declaration. We're going home. And, um, you know, we'll sort it out on the other side. So it was, it was a global move for us over a, a couple day period. The limiting factor was just our operations team's ability to get people home, you know, VPNs, right security. Hey, I need a laptop, you know, at our scale of, of you know, upwards of 1,700 plus people. You know, it, it just took a couple of days physically. But other than that, it, it, was, it was very straightforward. Got it. Got it. So, um, just to give our uh, viewers a, sort of a, a timestamp, we're recording this on, on April 30th of 2020. Mm-hmm. Walk me through April. You know, April was the month where everyone really did start hunkering down at home here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, did, did you see dramatic changes in, in how MSPs were operating and in, in how they were managing their businesses, how they're interacting with you? What did you see in the market in April? It, it's a great question. Um, I think... You know, I did a webinar for MSPs, well, probably going back about a month ago. And I said, I'll probably regret it, but I'll make some predictions. And uh, I said, the first thing is, I think we all have to focus on stabilizing our business, whatever that means for you, right? Some people are just not prepared to work from home. You yeah. know, you have a one, one bedroom apartment, your kids are in Zoom school, you know, you got the dogs barking away. Like that, that's a thing, you know, where, where's everybody going to actually work? How are you going to work? How do you communicate? How do you get paid? So I think there were a couple weeks of that. And for MSPs, it was just this double witching hour or whatever they call it, because you've got your customers calling saying, hey, I just sent my 100 employees home. Can you swing by this weekend to all of their houses and get them all set up with a, you know, with a UCAS? 
Yeah. And, and you just go, um, really? Like, I've got three people. I've got four techs. You know? <laughs> and then, by the way, seven other clients just called me. So I think that was the shock to the system. And then, you know, to add insult to injury, it's, oh, yeah, we don't really want to pay you. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, MSP is going, well, actually, we were thinking about charging $150 an hour, right? Because you have to get paid for your time. And my time on the weekends in a crisis where my employees are going to be potentially in harm's way, um, you know, I need to be paid. And so I think there was really a several week period, call it end last three weeks of March, maybe even into April in some regions where everybody had to adjust to, you know, A, I want to help my partners, but, you know, and simultaneously, I got to worry about my own business. And so really no different for us. We start getting the early calls from the hospitality industry, you know, uh, you know, there's going to be that kind of aha moment for them, which is, you know, if you're an MSB, it's pretty rare, but if you're an MSB that focuses on restaurants, right. um, you know, all of a sudden, every one of your clients is just, it's just shuttered. And so you can have that panic moment. Um, we, in that webinar, I basically tried to say to people, you know, stabilize your business first. This is just kind of the put your own oxygen mask on. You can't help your customers if you, if, if you sort of don't know where your employees are and if they're safe and everybody's comfortable. And, you know, if you have some, one of your employees in financial difficulties, you, you got to sort of shore up the line. Then you start helping your partners. And I think the, the instincts are to kind of stay away, give people space. And I think it's, it, it's the opposite, right? Um, the reason the industry so far has fared better than expected is this is their time to shine. You call your customers more. Um, you might just be talking sports. They miss the Premier League. They miss the, you know, whatever NBA team is on. Um, you might be asking them what are their unique difficulties. Okay, they took their laptops. They're working from home. You know, let's start talking about August a little bit. You know, when you're back, what can we do? Uh, one thing we saw, of course, was immediate um, restrictions on working on premise. And a lot of gear is on premise. So I think everybody immediately says, oh, the whole world's moving to the cloud next week. You, you and I know that's not possible. Is this accelerating thinking about the cloud? Yes. Will this accelerate action on the back end of the cloud? Yes, it will. But, you know, if it was easy to just push a button and move all your car dealership legacy platforms over to Azure AWS, you would have already pushed the button. Right. If it was definitely going to cost 30% less, you would have already pushed the button. MSPs aren't 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 uh, dumb, you know. They are moving 0365 seats. They are moving file sync and share. They're moving what they can move, and this will likely accelerate, you know, that on the on the back end. So so I think we had those kind of things going on. The prediction I made to, to to the MSPs based on previous crises is, in the middle of it, when you have that aha moment, at that moment, whatever your thoughts are, it's different for all of us you're going to kind of have peak uncertainty and sort of peak anxiety, peak downside case forecast, right? That's, that's oh my God, half my business is going to be gone. You have to sort of play through that day by day, daily cadence, customer by customer, right? One call you know, per another. And I made a prediction by the end of April, we'll understand the shape of this crisis. And, and that's when you can start setting your real plans in motion. And I stand by that. I think now we all know that, it's millions and, and you know, it's 10 million, tens of millions of people that are affected. We all know that the death rate's not 10%, it's, it's 1% or half percent. You know, we can start to scale it and size it relatively. We've seen our first month of business drop um, you know, as, as individual companies and, and you can understand your exposure. And now you can start to set, I think, kind of realistic plans, right? Mm -hmm. um, bar barring some other, you know, this virus mutates and you know, is five times worse in, in the fall. But I think we now know that most developed nations and, and states are kind of peaking now. Maybe they're peaking in a week or two. And we start to focus on what reopening and new normal looks like. So, yeah, yeah. You know, some of the conversation in April, the chatter, um, I, I consider myself an, an observer, right? And a listener. Mm -hmm. and, and the things I heard during that moment of panic or crisis among the partners, they were all, you know, almost like, asking for things, but they didn't even know what to ask for, but they wanted to quote unquote more from vendors, right? right? right. So, so I guess you know, now that the, the, the nervousness has calmed down a little bit in the industry, mm -hmm. let's look back on April and that during that panic, um, I think it is a key question, just how much should technology companies be doing for their partners and how much should be partners be responsible on their own? I mean, have you given thought to that in terms of just how much you can help the partner yeah. base? And where you can't. 
A- absolutely. I mean, you, and, and uh, you know, you've met you've met our founder. You know how how uh, um, you know big his soft spot is for partners. That's translated into the whole company. You know, we call it partners. We call it community. We we don't sell direct, and uh, so you bet. Just like a parent, you want to absolutely be there for them. Um, the kind of how much should they do though, and and, and I stress this in my my webinar. Um, really translates into how much can you do. So I, I think we need to ignore the headlines. I mean, uh, Datto is not the company that's going to come out and say, you know, we're funding MSPs to the tune of this. Those are those are false headlines. Um, you can, and, and I'll give you a few examples. You can take these headline numbers that some companies will put out and divide by the number of partners that are customers they have, and you'll find out, you know, it's it's a few hundred dollars per partner. So, you know, if you're a partner that needs $50,000, you can't get that from a vendor. We're not banks. And I don't think anybody will tell you that. So um, what you can do is very top levels of service, right? You can absolutely do that. Um, there are opportunities, you know, in the restaurant or travel or people that you're really seeing their business go to, you know, down 50, 60, 70 percent. There are opportunities for forbearance. There are opportunities to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to sort of provide some relief right? So that the service stays and they can continue to serve their customers. Um, their time is their time. They have to allocate that. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, Verizon Mobile is publishing stats that they're up 40 or 50%. Uh, Zoom is up like 10x. Um, nobody's giving that away. You still have to pay your Verizon bill. But, you know, the, the cell service should be incredible. And I do think I believe them when they said they've, you know, they've added you know, thousands of workers and, and adding towers, adding capacity. And, you know, Zoom has actually functioned quite well for us in spite of the, you know, the heavy, heavy loads. And so I think first and foremost is a, is a service. I think the se- second thing that you can do, and it's just hard, but it's one-on-one. I would call it bespoke service. And I'll, I'll translate those, both those concepts, you know, for a data or, or any vendor into MSPs. It's the same for MSPs to SMBs, Right. If you're an MSP and your SMBs are struggling, you don't want to be doing blast emails 30% off our service, right? Or April's free, you know, if you sign up now. I mean, that that just doesn't resonate. It, it actually just feels really off-brand. And, um, you know, you want to call them up one by one and say, what do you need? You know, what's going to – it's perfectly fine to sell. And in, in our case, since we have channel partners, um, sales means that our partner is getting a sale. So we love – you know, forget our revenue, we'll be fine. We love when a partner is calling saying, I need to buy something because we know that's revenue for them and they're serving a hospital, they're serving some other front line. Uh, you know, there's a lot of activity still going on. And so I, I think you have to view it as I'll do whatever I can for you. And then I gave a little bit of, of advice that people might think is a little bit tough, which was serve your paying customers best and first, um, right? Lawyers have this, this notion of pro bono, and that means they overcharge you and I a little bit. Um, and 10% of the time they get to go work for nonprofits or you know, anybody they want. And we all have this urge right now to help the local school, help the, help the client who can't pay. Um, and I think there's room to do that, but that comes because you're helping everybody else. And so is this a time when you're going to work nights and work weekends? You bet it is. They're going to remember you for how many hours you put in and how fast you responded um, and you're not going to get paid any extra effect. You're probably going to get paid less, but you do have to get paid. And I think that is a, you know, a lasting lesson for me from the internet crash, from the global yeah. real estate meltdown. I mean, I, I had a, a, you know, a hood ornament view on those two crashes um, as a, as a C-level executive. And, you know, when you look back, not everybody made it on the customer side. You know, you will have been glad you put the preponderance of your effort into the, into the paying customers. So I think those are the obligations. And then, frankly, the last thing I did was, you know, a little bit prod the industry and kind of said, it's okay to sell. There are opportunities out here. Um, I've seen some 10,000 plus seat deals come across. You know, they're doing hospital chains. They're doing frontline government responders, uh, schools, universities have sent everybody home. What are they doing? They're repainting the dorms and, and upgrading their networks. Um, enterprises that everybody at home are, are, are th- rethinking this. So, you know, in our case, while you had a couple of slow weeks on activation for continuity devices, it's hard to go out and go into a company that's picked right back up again. It's never been safer to go to a law firm. There's nobody there. You know, the owner lets you in the front door, six feet spacing, please. And you go in and you work in the server room and you do all that housekeeping 
that you've fallen behind on for the last six months. Mm -hmm. So I, I did challenge people now, once you're safe, your clients are safe, you, you stabilize the business. Um, this isn't over. This is going to be a, a, a marathon, not a sprint. Start selling. Doesn't mean a hardcore sell. It's not a promotional sale. It's a do what we as an industry do best, which is create solutions, it involves innovation. Um, you know, it's, it's RMM, it's, it's SAS protection, it's UCAS, it's all the things they need first to get stable. But then it's, it's start to look at the six month roadmap. The MSPs that are truly managed service already have that roadmap. They're doing yeah. that work, right? So, so be my partner, be my strategist. Um, I couldn't be more encouraged about the industry's role coming out of this thing as a, as a leader in, uh, in, in, in where SMB tech goes. Yeah, you know, you, you just use the key word, I think, and that is strategist. You know, it, it, it is okay to sell, but but ultimately, um, as the MSP, you want to listen, but you also want to strategize and call that customer and say, let's sit down and strategize about what your business looks like, what your needs are, et cetera. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, but, but building on that point, um, as we look ahead now, do you think the MSPs themselves and this industry are forever changed by this? Or do we go mostly... like? Some people think work from home becomes like mm. for everyone, which I believe. Yeah. How so, much change do you think we'll see in the industry that is truly permanent change? It, it's a it's a great question, and I'll stick up front. I'm biased by you know all these previous crises, micro or macro, right? I mean, I, half the friends I had after 9-11 said, oh, I'm never getting on an airplane again. I'm taking the John Madden bus everywhere, right? And okay, that lasted about eight weeks, right? It turns out airline travel is ridiculously cheap and convenient. Um, so I, I've heard the same now. We're just all going to work from home. It's over. Commercial real estate's done. Um, I don't buy that for a second. So, so short term, um, it has permanently changed the industry you, you, in, in as much as you can't see GDP plummet you know, 20, 25, 30% like you're seeing in these countries and not expect Q2 to be ugly. Uh, you know, it's not going to bounce back to normal in Q3. So there are some number of months or quarters where we're changed. Um, MSP still control, you've heard me say this many times, over 10% of that 1.2 trillion of SMB tech spend though, right? So suppose the 1.2 plunges to 700 this year, there's still 70 billion up for grabs. So I don't think we're all going to sit around and and claim there's not enough, you know, target market. I don't think SMBs are going to contract on their tech spending other than to the degree they're in a vertical. But here's a fun example. Every restaurant closed immediately when the governor in the state says close. Um, some of them already did takeout and delivery. Those are the winners. Some of them are actually reporting higher numbers than they had before and might just close the, the, the office, right? And just go with the, you know, the Chinese food takeout model because it's often more profitable. But, you know, a pub is coming back. They're going to come back, though, knowing how to do takeout and delivery. So the first wave was every single restaurant that wants to be open has reopened as a takeout delivery. Second wave, guess what? Now they're all grocery stores because the wholesale food chain is all set up to deliver to grocery. The governors have all waived all these rules. You can go to my favorite restaurant down the street here and do your, your kind of produce grocery shopping. They'll give you a six of beer. And, uh, and you can get takeout, you know, uh, steaks and, and, and other things. So um, that's not going away now, right? So whatever they cobble together short term is, is a duct tape solution. An MSB that serves them now goes back in and says, okay, you're going to reopen. But what's it look like in the new, new normal? Turns out Tim still loves to go to the restaurant, but, but Mary next door prefers the, you know, the, the Grubhub app. And uh, yeah, but Grubhub takes a lot, of the, a lot of the spread here. Maybe we should go with a different app. There's... There's so much room to rethink now, you know, what they've done short term to go long term. But are we going back to restaurants? I, I, I can't imagine that we're not. I, I think, I, again, if anything, it's whatever path we were on to digital transformation for SMBs. It may bend that up a little bit. But our belief has always been we're only 10, 15 percent into that. Right. You know, I mean, a coffee shop's got a square terminal and bad Wi-Fi. They haven't exactly digitally transformed the whole business. And at the same time, I like sitting in a coffee shop and I'm pay, willing to pay a premium for that. And so I actually think it's kind of a fun time. I hate to use the word fun in a crisis. Get through the crisis. You know, we have health. Uh, you know, we're all worried about families. And I, I, I did hear that you had a, a, a major impact in, in the family recently. And I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. We're doing okay. 80, Thank you, though. I, I have an 80 plus year old mom, uh, you know, 1,500 miles from me. I'm very worried about her every day. You know, I finally convinced her that she had to quarantine and, 
it was an interesting, long strategic conversation. And yeah. so you know, I'm, I'm not ignoring the human implications on the back end of this, though, when you come out of it and you go, what do these businesses look like? It's fascinating. I think, you know, probably we will buy more cars online, but I still have to go to the dealership. Ultimately, I still have to get it serviced and it's going to transform how they think about technology. And mm -hmm. to me, that's pure opportunity for the industry. And, you know, let's start thinking that through now, as soon as we're, we have our employees safe. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's sort of... As you think that through, I'm curious, are you hearing similar conversations or vastly different conversations as you speak to country matter managers in Europe, yeah. Australia, Asia, et cetera? Are there similarities uh, in terms of the threads or is it totally different from region to region? Yeah, um, it's a different region to region only in as much as where people are in the curve, right? Uh, um, so I think it's... Uh, you know, it's safe to say orders are probably better in the South. The states are opening up again. Will that turn out to be the right strategy? I, that's not the approach I'd take if I was a governor, but it's, uh, you know, it's one strategy and we'll probably see sales picking up. I'm guessing our sales are, are fairly poor in New York City still. That's, a, that's still a few more weeks in the psyche, shall we say. It's a resilient city that's been hit so many times, but, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't start there. So the regional conversations have been more there. You do know that in Europe, um, and, and maybe in Asia, more businesses have uh, started the shift to the cloud. But, uh, you know, again, I, I think you have to talk about all the different layers of hybrid cloud. So a lot of MSPs I see in Europe are basically looking to do desktop, right? That's we'll procure your laptop desktop. We'll put 0365 and into it QuickBooks on there. Um, and then, you know, a systems house or some larger integrator is still maintaining your, your servers and your legacy applications. And, so for me, cloud doesn't just move out through, mean 0365. It means I literally have no infrastructure and I've outsourced it all. And that's a hybrid world for a long, long time. Um, Asia is willing to go there faster. They just move more quickly. Um, you know, in the U.S., we, we're moving more slowly. People still run Windows 2000 in some industries. Um, and it's just a thing. And so that's not bad for MSPs. They just need to figure out how to help lead that transition. There is going to be an amazing lift in MSP revenue for the folks that can help lead people to the cloud. But it's not the same as reselling Dell. It's not the same as, as reselling 0365, right? right? You gotta get your hands dirty, software applications, lift and shift at a minimum, maybe rewriting some middleware, partnering with some, you know, some SIs. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a bold new future. Yeah. It, it's funny you should mention that just yesterday. Uh, I, I have to apologize because I don't remember the research firm, but but I got this piece of research that talked about Azure MSPs and that how they have to also be integrators and application yeah. consultants. You can't just be a pure MSP. So to your point, you, you're really going to have to understand a whole uh, boatload you, of new services and solutes up you, in the cloud rather than just reselling O3. You and I have been doing tech for decades. I would, as an expert, you know, that you are, I would defy you to go to Microsoft's website and try to figure out how to buy Azure and tell me how much it costs and tell me what you just bought. Right. Um, right. right? It is a journey. It's not an afternoon. It's a journey. It's a, it's a journey worth taking if your client wants to go there. Now, when you take the journey and you get your third month's bill, it might be lower than your, your previous spend or it might be much higher and right. you don't get to know in advance. And so helping your clients on that journey is going to be critical um, and, and, you know, just because we're doing this remotely doesn't mean they're going to want to do everything remotely. So I think it's, if there's a permanent lasting effect, it changes the nature of the conversation. It adds the value that MSPs bring. It puts it front and center. And, uh, you know, I, I'll give you one other perspective. I said on this webinar, I have a lasting memory coming out of the last two big crises. The global financial meltdown was the scariest, right? I mean, Bank of America, you know, Barclays Bank, banks were tipping over. We weren't sure if the government was going to tip over, right? It was a, it was a profound economic damage. Um, internet crash was, you know, super fast. But we, we all kind of knew like, okay, we drank the Kool-Aid. We were, we were up here at 100 times something and, and everybody's plunging together. It was like, yeah, that was a fun party, 90s. I think coming out of that though, you had Salesforce.com. You had SaaS software. And I can remember yep. because I was a chief financial officer at the time, I wasn't going to pay anybody per month, right? You sell me your license in a box. I was fighting to even pay you maintenance at 15%. Okay. So 
Now all of a sudden, oh yeah, you know, cash is a little tight. Okay, I'm willing to do this month to month thing. Let's try it. And of course it flourished. Then 0809 comes along, coming out of that, everything as a service, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you don't actually need a taxi. You don't even need a car, just Uber it. You don't need a hotel. You certainly don't need to rent a, a villa. You can just Airbnb it. And now we have hundreds and hundreds. So the, the, the capital cycle went there. I think it's the dawn of the recurring revenue revolution for all the MSPs that have not fully made that plunge, right? The, yeah. the SMB coming out of this is going to say, I need a lot more tech. You go, great, let me get a $120,000 quote over for the gear. Whoa, 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 we're in a crisis here, man. Um, okay, uh, could you do $3,000 a month on, on a managed contract? Yeah, I think I could do that. Okay, well, for $3,000 a month, here's what I could give you. If you got $5,000 a month, here's what I could give you. And you start walking them up that chain, it's the exact way that Salesforce created the platform. It's the exact way that, that Uber created the platform. And, um, you know, to me, this could spell the beginning of the end of the break fix on the one-time project. And it, it should give MSPs the courage to go back, um, you know, in, into the managed service, into the recurring revenue yeah. conversation. And, you know, and frankly, I think you'll see the quote unquote recurring project out of that. So, so the MSPs will stay project involved, but it'll be on a recurring, that strategic meeting conversation you're talking about. That's right. Uh, and, and I do see upside here. Um, I want to shift the conversation uh, from the MSPs back to Datto a bit. Um, Yeah, sure. You know, I did hear, um, again, we're talking in late April here, but I did hear, this was in early 2020, I I was speculating pretty regularly that Datto may be pursuing an IPO sometime soon. Um, Mm -hmm. And I realized the pandemic has since come along. Um, And again, I'll use the word speculation. It It was just some chatter I was hearing from third parties. Any update on on sort of, either A, your financial status, or B, data, ever going public. What's your thought there at this point? Yeah, that's a, that's an old parlor game from uh, 2015, I think. I, I joined in 2017, but it, it seems to get asked every year. Um, you know, it's not something I'll, 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 I'll comment on specifically, other than to say, because uh, employees ask all the time, mm-hmm. you know, we're the same data as always. I think if you go all the way back, you know, it was Austin, and, and he owned the whole thing, or maybe as a uh, Maybe one of his family members did for the for the first little bit, right? Usually you get a check. He was right out of school, uh, so there's there was the interfamily, uh, you know, exchange. Then then you know he's the owner of this thing. He likes to tell the story of how excited he was when he first issued employee stock options, right? And then then it was Austin and employees. Then venture capitalists came, um, and then they left, and private equity came. And we've had this various you know different sets of investors. Companies always grown, always been good in that, and I think. Every one of those sets of investors has brought something interesting and better to the table, and the culture hasn't changed a bit because each time we've, we've brought on new, new equity owners, equity investors, we've looked them in the eye and said, this is the franchise. Datto is MSPs. If you, you know, invest in this business and try to go direct, if you invest in this business and try to go enterprise or consumer or you know, anything else, if you invest in this business and try to raise price 20% and squeeze the partners, you're going to fail. This is a journey uh, that we're all on together, and it's a singular bet on the channel. And, and we lead the channel in tech, um, and we lag the channel in growth, and we grow together, and, and, and we're okay with that. It's an enduring marathon. You know, it's an enduring value play. And so all I would tell you there is, you know, we're, we're, we're in you know, very good financial strength. We've never made any of those sort of investment decisions for anything other than to sort of accelerate growth. And, um, you know, where one set of owners wanted to sell for, for their own liquidity reasons and a different set of owners said, we get it. We, we know that this is still very, very early innings in terms of uh, the MSP industry. And, and, and certainly Vista, you know, our, our current uh, you know, private equity investor understood that, really approached us and said, we love, love, love MSPs. We get it. And we think that was the right, the right play for us to, to get exposure to that. And so it's been... Uh, you know, it's been a great journey. So that's, uh, that's about as much as I'd say about it at this point. Um, I think you could, uh, you know, you could safely say this is the, the wrong time in some capital markets to, uh, to, to go much further, but um, you know, those, those market windows open and, and close and we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll always uh, you know, do sort of our, our examination in that context. Okay. 
All right, thanks. And, and I hope you don't mind me asking every time I see you that same question over and over again. <laughs> no, it's uh, it is it's 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 not offensive. It's a, it's a, a logical question people could ask, and uh, you, you know it's a. Uh, Something that's hard, hard to comment on uh, in, in, in any case, good, good market or bad. So, yep, yep. Uh, hey, the other thing on a lot of MSPs' uh, minds is Datocon. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that uh, as I understand it, I think it's set for early uh, June in Atlanta. Is that still the case? You still going face to face? Might you go digital only? What's the thought process? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's been a little fun, a little drama. Um, mm-hmm. Datocon is scheduled for June eighth to the tenth in the in the wonderful city of Atlanta. Um, you know, candidly, Joe, I, I personally don't see how we can responsibly bring 4,000 people together in one place, mm-hmm. given the healthcare crisis. Um, in addition, many of the attendees come from other countries and would actually at this point be barred from entry. Um, so we're, uh, we're in late stage negotiations with the city of Atlanta, our hosts and the hotels with an eye toward postponing the event toward a safer time. Um, as you know, uh, states, uh, U.S. states are taking different sort of approaches here. And, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll let you sort of follow the, the drama with the uh, Atlanta mayor and the, and the Georgia governor. Um, they have, uh, you know, at, at some points, I think, opened the theaters and, uh, and have some view that they're going to have tens of thousands of people in conventions in May. Um, that's not my view. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of in, in discussions and, and have been for, for a bit here. So, uh, you know, what, what I would pledge is, um, you know, we're hopeful of having an agreement that we can announce, you know, in a matter of days, and um, I would pledge we would never put employees, vendors, partners in any sort of health, you know, kind of harm's way. So we're, we're very conservative in that. Data won't be the first company back to work when there's a return to mm-hmm. work sort of a, a phase. And um, it would be likewise with our roadshow events and likewise with DataCon. So it didn't make sense to guarantee it was on six weeks, seven weeks yeah. ago. And it didn't make sense to cancel it. It made sense to kind of wait and see. And obviously, we'll make everybody whole and make it right. And um, and look forward to, uh, you know, to, to both postponing this and hopefully, you know, having the same level of success. And then we've got DattoCon Berlin on for October mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, f- fingers crossed the world sort of gets their arms around that, but it would be the same thing there. You know, we would, uh, we wouldn't host it unless we were highly confident from, from local health experts and, and really our own health experts that it was a safe event to do. So. Got it. Got it. Thank you for the background. So, you know, to tie things together, let, let's bring it back to the MSPs and, and sort yep. of uh, sort of some closing thoughts, for lack mm. of a better term. Ultimately, what is the takeaway message from Datto to MSPs right now in the current state of the market? Yeah, from Datto to MSPs, it's uh, it's on the one hand, you know, long term, brighter than ever. You know, we, we could not be more bullish. This may cause some people to walk away from you know, riding the MSB horse, so to speak, this may cause some people to say, oh, it's going to be Microsoft that wins it all. Or I, I've heard all kinds of theories, but MSPs are going to lead. The SMB IT trillion plus is still sitting there. It's so early, even in mature markets like, you know, New England or, or UK, or it is just still so early in terms of MSB penetration. It's going to be a little different. I don't think it's going to be any kind of trends, whether it's security, IoT, shift to cloud, those trends are all the same. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, get a head fake and suddenly remake my whole business into a Zoom reseller. You know, right. if that fits in your portfolio, so be it. I would probably go somewhere else, even though I love Zoom, and go somewhere else because for MSPs, it's margin. Go yeah. find a cheaper solution that you think works just as well. There's a dozen of them. So we'll keep preaching for MSPs, lead your SMBs, be their advisor, go to get recurring revenue. I, I just promise you that's going to be more of a thing on the other end of this. And I think it's financeable. So you know, if you come out less financially stable and you know, coming out of the crisis, uh, banks, venture capital, private equity, they're going to lend into recurring revenue. I've talked about that on the main stage of DattoCon every year for the last couple of years. That's the lasting value, whether you're giving it to your kids, whether you're selling it to somebody who's rolling them up, whether you want to get financial investment, recurring, recurring, recurring. In the short term, you know, I'm not as doomsday as, as, as others. I, I have seen, you know, a, a more than a couple of vendors out there telling people slash and burn, lay off your staff, you know, go to ground. I think it's frankly been promotional and self-serving. I think, you know, the, the kind of sub headline is get the cheapest services you can. And oh, by the way, did you know we're 75% off today? Yeah. Um, you know, this isn't a promotional sales environment. This is healing, take care of partners, take care of customers. They'll remember you for how you behaved and you have to work really hard. So I, I do think 
you know, if you don't have an accountant on your staff, get one, right? I mean, your uncle, your cousin, your aunt, uh, um, you know, study your business. If something has to be jettisoned in cost or the Friday lunches or the company car, whatever it has to be, you've got to take the pain. It doesn't strike me that it's going to last for years. I think it's a short term in the scheme of things kind of effect. And is that three months, six months, nine months? I don't know. But um, I think it's short term, run your business, serve your paying customers first and foremost. And then, you know, if you've got the room and it may be weekends, it may be nights, um, take care of anybody else that, that, that you think deserves it. I mean, we're all doing a lot of pro bono mm-hmm. work today. For Davos specifically, call us. Call us. We have engaged, you know, hundreds and hundreds of partners. You will not see a headline, you know, from us on Dados investing in the industry, blah, 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 blah. When the dust settles, though, I guarantee it'll be millions, if not tens of millions of dollars that we will have effectively transferred an economic value to partners because we call them partners and we're, we're working with them individually. You know, some of the early ones that had hotel kinds of problems, yeah. you know, we got it. We proactively called them. We said, we know you're hurting. What can we do? How can we help? You know, can we adjust your invoices a bit, et cetera? And, um, but it's not a time to be opportunists. It's not a time to, uh, you know, for, for people to be calling vendors and, and, and trying to, you know, say, hey, have you noticed times are tough? I want discounts. It's, it's a time to explain your situation and be a partner because and, and, you know, the industry can help very broadly. But I would end with no company can be the bank of its customers, right? Maybe Apple can. I haven't seen them offering many discounts on iPhones. Maybe Cisco can. They'll give you some vendor financing on routers. But, um, you know, th- that, that's a sort of very different kind of place, right? You still have to put your credit card in to get 0365. And, and so, you know, get paid and deliver over-the-top excite and delight service. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and sell a bit, but it's a soft sale. You know, be creative. Uh, be empathetic. Uh, to, to some degree, if I've been on the phone with dozens of MSPs, you know, again, they're shy. All I've said is call your, your customers and just talk to them. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them about their family. You know, empathize their situation. And it is shocking how many of those calls we've had where a week later the partner buys something. Yeah. And you kind of go, wait, 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 wait a minute. We weren't, we weren't making a sales call. They just had a need and they called somebody who was listening. So yeah. we've, we've, we've done a lot of EQ training for the whole sales team and, uh, you know, told them you're kind of half sales, but you're also half support and just, just the count friend. Yeah. And which, listening ear. Yeah. Which, you know, which is, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I inherited a culture where partners are first mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, in a way I'm, I'm less the leader of the, the, the team that a steward of that culture and it will survive me and I'll hand the baton on to, you know, somebody and hopefully some, some many years into the future and it'll still be the same data. And it, and it goes back to your investor comment as well. It's a, it's a more sustaining entity in that regard. I don't know if, uh, what the right analogy is American red cross or just somebody where you see the brand, you know what they do. You're not quite sure who leads it and uh, you're not quite sure how it all works, but you know, it's, it's, it's helpful when, when there's blood drive and, Dado is like MSP technology in that way. Yeah. Well, Tim, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I appreciate it. And best wishes in the weeks ahead. Well, we appreciate you f- for staying in touch. I'm sure your job is uh, is very different. Can I exit and ask you how, how your job has changed? Uh, you know what? I, I think my job has been uh, – the number one way my job has changed is to try to get MSPs closer to the money. And I'm not talking about vendor financing. I'm talking about – uh, the PPP loans, for instance, you know, we've been driving people to smaller community banks to other ways to make sure that that short term cash flow, that there is a bridge to tomorrow. So, we, you know, us, E to E, we've always covered the financial side of this. But yes. ultimately, we doubled down. You know, we really knew that we had to get the MSPs closer to the money on E to E and on our sister site, MSSP Alert. Listen, managed security services, the market is booming. But we want to be responsible. There have been some some hiccups here and there on the market, so we're covering that responsibly as well. But thanks. Yeah, for it is it is it is a shame. Cyber attackers seem to be a winner in this, and uh, you know you've seen the level of attacks really go go up a lot, and they're they're taking care of a lot of you know taking advantage of a lot of new increased attack surface while everybody's working from home, maybe not hanging off the VPN. It's a yeah. that that really is a shame. I'm sure you've seen some of our webinars. We agree with you completely. Vendors can't be the bank, but banks can be the bank. The stimulus money is overwhelmingly large. We've actually taken a few full-time employees. I, our chief accounting officer, for example, has become a real expert on that. We're obviously not eligible. It's not for our benefit, but we've run webinars. We've got all kinds of digital content for MSPs. They're welcome to call us 
and we'll sort of walk them through all of that right up to the point. I think we even have an application up and running where you can kind of go in and, and fill out a full application and push the button and it goes to, goes off to the bank. So, you know, th- that, that's what I mean by, by providing the help, right? It's, uh, right. I, I think that's the, I mean, a free RMM for a month is nice, but actually, you know, helping their business and going to try to find them that help uh, is exactly right. People understand the lasting value of MSPs as well. And I do think, unlike 09, which, as I said, I thought was scarier from a professional and economic perspective, mm-hmm. did not have this healthcare overlay where we're all freaking out about our families and friends and, you know, climbing the walls of our, of our home offices, did not have that, but it was scarier financially. This time around, there's a lot of dry powder, right? There's a lot of dry powder. So at the same time, you're servicing and, and selling with your, your end users, you know, don't be shy about having those conversations, you know, angel investors, venture investors, banks, as you said, the community banks, they live for this. I've seen, I've talked to my best friends, a community banker and, uh, you know, forgiving a lot of interest, a lot of payments, a lot of loans, three, six, nine months, they've got the Fed window open and behind them mm-hmm. and uh, can do a lot of creative things. So yeah. it's, a, it's a great point to exit on and uh, we, we wish everybody well and um, stay in touch, you know, that uh, Dad always answer the phone, and I'm still Tim at Dado.com. So we, we look forward to hearing from more partners. All right. I apologize in advance for all the emails I always send. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> be, be well, Joan. Thanks for, thanks for having me today.